Well, now let's celebrate change. Shall we do some change celebration? All right, I'm going back to the top of the list. Are you guys, are you guys okay? Yeah. All right, now instead of caffeine being forbidden, it's being served at BYU, <laughs> right? Now instead of general authorities, uh, now instead of general authorities being proud and confident in their doctrine, books like Mormon doctrine are being discontinued, right? Miracle forgiveness is sort of like slowly being marginalized and pushed away. Doctrines of salvation isn't in print anymore. Journal of discourses is now sort of forbidden from being used as a resource in church curriculum, right? So all these, all these sources of, of authoritative general authority utterances are now being marginalized and pushed aside. General authorities now sort of just largely speak general platitudes. They avoid discussions of doctrine or theology for the most part. Um, instead of all general authorities being proud and bold, we have general authorities starting to fray a little bit around the edges. We all wonder about what Elder Uchtdorf really believes and what he doesn't believe, right? And we have, uh, you know, former high level, higher level church leaders like Tom Phillips and Hans Matson. Uh, starting to be willing to speak openly about their disaffection and to talk about their apostasy openly and publicly, which is something I don't know that we've ever had a lot of uh, before. Um, instead of being proud about the things they have to share with the world as prophets of God, general authorities are now uh, asking people before they speak to not record anything they say and to keep it secret and private because they don't want many of the things that they say in stake and area conferences ever repeated outside of, of those private meetings. So they're becoming more secretive and actually private about, uh, I thought, you know, you would think that prophets would want to boldly declare to the world God's truth, but instead they're becoming more and more secret. And they're asking people, they're being concerned about even notes being taken about the things that they say. Many general authorities are now lawyers and PR people who focus more on uh, Kurt McConkie protecting the, the assets and the reputation of the church uh, and the businesses and managing the multi-billion dollar corporate assets and interests of the church instead of being, uh, you know, sort of ministers and, and priests uh, to help uh, those who are in need. Um, science uh, has not vindicated the church as the leaders had hoped and instead it's cast serious doubt on uh, the church's Timelines, uh, the creation myth, the flood myth, uh, the historicity of the, of the Bible, um, of the Book of Mormon, of the Book of Abraham. All that stuff is now sort of being directly challenged and threatened. And apologists have, have brought forth no credible evidence to support the historicity of the Book of Mormon, of the Book of Abraham, uh, of any of that stuff. Even the Joseph Smith translation now has been shown to be a plagiar plagiarized from a biblical commentary that was available during the time Joseph Smith was there. That was research that came out of BYU in the past few years, <laughs> oddly enough. Um, so so science, has not, uh, science has not demonstrated the Book of Mormon anthropologically, linguistically, archeologically, uh, genetically, pick your Lee, <laughs> pick your scientific discipline, uh, science has not vindicated any of the church's truth claims, let alone the Tower of Babel and the Jaredite migration or any of that sort of stuff that, that you know, the, book, the entire Book of Mormon uh, sort of depends upon. Now, instead of demonizing the Catholics and the evangelicals, we're trying to cozy up to them. We're trying to befriend them. We're trying to minimize the differences that we have between them and emphasize the similarities. We're downplaying all of our distinct, distinctive doctrine. And as Michael Quinn says, we're sort of selling our birthright for a mess of porridge by downplaying our distinctive doctrine and focusing on all the commonalities of our doctrine and theology with, with Catholics and with evangelical Christians. Why? Because we need their political support to fight same-sex marriage and to protect what we like to call what? Religious freedom, right? And so they become our allies politically. Um, and in some sense, the enemy of my enemy becomes my friend. Um, so that's a very different approach. Um, uh, in addition to our distinctive doctrine and theology being uh, minimized, um, 
what has not changed is that authority, obedience to priesthood authority, has been exalted to the most sacred Mormon doctrine of all. There is nothing more important than obedience to patriarchal priesthood authority in Mormonism. It is the most sacred doctrine and theological. In, in some sense, it's the only, it's only true, I immutable, uh, important doctrine um, or theological component of Mormonism uh, that we cling to tenaciously. Criticism is still forbidden, um, but there is, this is on the positive side, there is an increased willingness to discuss and admit the imperfections of church leaders. So you are still not allowed to criticize church leaders, as Bill Reel recently uh, shows when he called Elder Holland, basically liar, liar, pants on fire. Um, <laughs> And, 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 and it's still true, as Elder Oaks says, uh, that it is wrong to criticize a church leader, even if the criticism is accurate or true. <laughs> However, you have heard an increase in statements in general conference where general authorities are willing to say, give Brother Joseph a break. We're not always perfect. Um, you know, we deserve your slack. So we are, members are being encouraged to, to um, look with patience and forbearance on the weaknesses of their leaders, but they're not allowed yet to cross that line of actually openly criticizing them uh, in public. Um, instead of the church handbook of instructions being secret, at least a good half chunk of the handbook instructions is now publicly uh, online and made available. That's an increase, a step towards transparency. Um, We've noticed that the, the headings to the Book of Mormon and the Book of Abraham have been conveniently changed in recent years, right? So instead of the Book of Mormon being about the, the ancestors or the descendants of Lehi, right? It's now written about those who were among, right? Uh, the, the people, the inhabitants uh, of ancient America. And of course, that change was made in response to DNA evidence and other scientific evidence, making it very clear uh, that Native Americans came from where? Asia, Asia not from uh, Israel, across boats, you know, across the Atlantic Ocean or Pacific Ocean or whichever ocean they, uh, you know, mythologically traveled. And the Book of Abraham, I didn't realize that the heading to the Book of Abraham has also recently been changed, right? It's no longer written, yeah, I, I don't have the quotes here, but it's no longer written by the hand of Abraham translating an ancient text, but instead the forward sort of mentions inspiration and revelation instead of translation. <laughs> basically, basically saying, stop thinking of this book as a translation. So they're changing the narrative on the so book of Abraham. Was that done? How far you past that few years, I think. I think on the internet over the past five years. I, uh, I'll have, well, so one of you look that up right now and let us know, but I think it's a relatively recent change. I could be wrong about that. Okay. Book of Mormon translation, they're starting to use the word... I'm getting there. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm getting there. Sorry. No, we're, I'm, we're, not even, we're not even close to done yet. Oh, no. Do you, um, Roll. Okay. Instead of the church focusing on it being exclusively true, right, in the one true church, now the focus is on staying in the bone. Don't leave. Doubt your doubts, right? Um, focus on the goodness of the church, not necessarily the truthfulness of the church. Fear messages about what's going to happen if you leave. Um, and a little bit more softening of the rhetoric through Terrell and Fiona Givens and others, Patrick Mason. There's truth in every church and in every religion. You know, we just have a few distinctive things like priesthood ordinances that, that, that is our contribution to humanity, but other religions have their contributions to humanity. A very different message um, instead of sort of, this is the one true and only living church on the face of the earth. We've moved away from that rhetoric in many instances. We're de-emphasizing spiritual gifts. I just, I didn't see general conference, but I heard about this talk, was it from Bednar? Which basically said, have the faith to not be healed. Right? So instead of an emphasis on having the faith to be healed, now the general authorities are saying, have the faith to not be healed. Right? So they're changing that message. Why? Because so many people aren't being healed and they're talking openly about it. Right? That, that they have to change your expectations. So have the faith to not be healed. Right? And, and they're, they're also 
changing the rhetoric about inspiration. They're lowering the bar about receiving some sort of really concrete witness. And instead, they're telling you, you, had, you knew it was true all along. Don't seek a witness, right? You've always known it's true. Or it's just this sense of joy or peace that you get. It's not some overwhelming witness. Stop looking for that. Uh, that's not the message I got when I was growing up in seminary. I was taught that with Moroni 10, 4, you would get an undeniable witness to the core of your soul and your heart if you read the Book of Mormon and prayed about it to know it was true. And it never came for me, and that's why uh, that was one of the main impetuses, impeti for my faith crisis. <laughs> um, instead of being proud of our Mormon heritage, bafflingly, we are now forbid not only forbidding uh, the identity of Mormonism and calling ourselves Mormons, but we're calling it, uh, you know, we're, we're claiming that Satan rejoices when we refer to each other as Mormons. <laughs> And we're doing that from the Mormon newsroom, right? From, from Mormon.org. It's crazy. We didn't think this through, right? Instead of boldly proclairing the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, it's, it, we're changing the name of the Mormon Tabernacle Satan's, Choir. Satan is clever. <laughs> Satan is super clever. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're running away from our identity. That is one of the most mind-boggling things. Identity is important. Identity is one of the most important things you can have as a human. And, when, and, and as an institution, it's your brand, it's, it's how you're known. When an institution starts to run away from its own, you know, century earned, centuries earned identity, it's a sign of significant distress um, um, and trouble. So that, that, that it will be interesting to see if that gets rolled back. Um, because that is a deeply troubling sign if it continues. Instead of having these wonderful pageants, it's almost like Christmas is canceled. We're canceling, you know, the Manti pageant and the Hilkamore pageant. You know, no more, no more pageants. Um, all these cultural activities that, that Sandra cleverly said earlier today, these were the things that she loved most about Mormonism. A lot of these things like roadshows and potlucks and, and temple trips and dance festivals are being canceled. Um, and, and they're making smaller and smaller and smaller the, the opportunities for cultural engagement. Uh, they're being gutted or eliminated and budgets are being reduced and the money's being sent to corporate headquarters and not being invested in the local units to allow uh, these cultural uh, developments. The home teaching program has been eliminated. What world are we in? <laughs> they eliminated or renamed the home teaching program to ministering and this is a major shift in Mormon identity, right? This is a major shift. Elders and high priest quorum have been merged. I don't know who's being punished more by that, the elders and <laughs> high priests. <laughs> but that, that's just inflicting pain all the way around. <laughs> Unbelievably, our, our relationship with the Boy Scouts of America is ending in 2019. Thomas S. Monson is rolling over in his grave as we've eliminated a cornerstone uh, to Mormon youth development, or at least male youth development, the church is being scheduled, the church schedule is being reduced to two hours instead of three. The amount of commitment that is being asked of the membership is being reduced. And any basic sociologist will tell you, the more you expect from your members, the greater the commitment that they will exhibit. And the lower the commitment you expect from your members, the lower commitment they're going to have to your organization. So they are weakening by, by reducing that commitment. They are literally weakening the resolve and the commitment of their members. Um, after Jeffrey Holland's debacle with the, with the BBC, when he was interviewed on that segment called Meet the Mormons, and he was so embarrassed by those journalists, you're seeing general authorities completely unwilling to meet with the media. Uh, we've gone from Gordon B. Hinckley meeting with Mike Wallace on 60 Minutes and Larry King to Thomas S. Monson pretty much never entertaining direct questions from journalists. And Russell M. Nelson did in that very initial sort of launch of his administration, uh, but that was a disaster. Even church, even church headquarters PR has admitted privately that that press conference was a disaster for, for the church and for Russell M. Nelson. I don't think we can expect 
open Q and A's with 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 uh, members of the press anytime soon. Mind-bogglingly, instead of being encouraged to keep journals, and this is one of the most dark, sinister, and disturbing elements on my list. General authorities are now being forbidden from keeping journals. Oh, John, there's part two of that. I don't know if we, I ever told you this. Um, when, a, when a general authority of 70 is made emeritus, he goes through a lengthy interview process, his entire life history, all his memories. They take that, they document it, they edit it, put it in chronological order, etc. go back and review it with him multiple times, put it in big thick binders and say, forever after you will not speak of anything that is not already correlated and approved that's documented in these. Yeah, documents. yeah it's a super Orwellian yeah. sort of approach to history where they're forbidding general authorities to keep journals and they're doing everything they can to keep meetings from being recorded, to keep you know, their own words from being recorded, and they're trying to put everything down the memory hole, which is really disturbing. Um, believe it or not, areas of uh, same-sex attraction or LGBT issues are actually a major highlight for this list. Um, thanks to advancements in research and advocates and evangelists, over the past 10, 14, 13 years, the church is uh, no longer teaching that being same-sex attracted is sinful in and of itself. They're willing to say that the, the, the attractions themselves are not sins. They're willing to acknowledge LGBT identities for the first time. Uh, the Mormon and Gays website was the first time the church ever officially was willing to use the term gay or lesbian or bisexual. Before that time, you could only say you know, afflicted with same-sex attraction. But now the church is willing to actually say, heaven forbid, the word gay or lesbian or bisexual. That's progress to people who take pride in their identity. The church is no longer, uh, Evergreen has disappeared. Since, since we did some research on reparative or conversion therapy um, and released that and people started suing reparative therapy organizations for, for abusing their members, and they were exposed as fraudulent, right? Because all these people who were testifying to have been converted from gay to straight were secretly in illicit sexual affairs or would return to same-sex relationships privately or secretly or were lying the whole time anyway. That, that sort of showed that these, relation, these uh, organizations were built on fraud. And so now these organizations are being sued and organizations like Evergreen have disappeared from the face of the earth and that's a good thing. Now, of course, they've been replaced with organizations like North Star, right? And celibacy and mixed orientation marriages are being indirectly encouraged by lifting up examples like, like Ty Mansfield and his wife and others uh, through North Star as righteous, faithful people who are able to either be celibate or lived in a mixed orientation marriage. But at least there isn't an institutional recommendation uh, for, for LGBT people to enter into uh, mixed orientation marriages. And that's actually a positive step uh, because the divorce registers and the mental health registers in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s were filled with the carnage of straight and LGBT Mormons who were pushed into mixed orientation marriages and celibacy uh, and reparative therapy to their own detriment. So to the church's credit, they have made positive changes um, in this regard. Uh, the church has made the bold and courageous step to, to tell parents not to kick their LGBT children out of their homes anymore. And they've actually said, at least on the website, that, that we should lead the world in loving our LGBT uh, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters. Now, of course, none of the members actually know the Mormons and Gays website exists, <laughs> right? And most bishops don't even know that that website exists. But at least the church is starting to make progress in this regard, and they deserve uh, credit for it. Um, instead of parents just automatically siding against their LGBT children, we now have the Mama Dragons. This, incre this incredible, amazing organization of over a thousand women dedicated to supporting and nurturing and fighting for their LGBT children. That's an amazing innovation, uh, innovation that the social media and the internet has brought about. Um, instead of six million members, members, the church is claiming 16 million members. But interestingly enough, 
they've started discouraging members to focus on statistics. And they've said, you know, we're not about statistics. That's not what the gospel is about. And they've even gone again to a very disturbing Orwellian step. After, se- after over a century, I guess, of reporting church statistics, just in the past year or two, they made the announcement to stop reporting their statistics in general conference. Now, why would they stop reporting their statistics in general conference? It's because the news isn't positive. The church is starting to grind. The church growth is starting to decline significantly. It's now less than 1%. Um, It's not the fastest growing church in the world. Even though we claim 16 million members, uh, estimates are that there are only five to six million Mormons in the world who actually identify as Mormon and attend church, right? A a good one third of that 16 million, we don't even know where they are or who, who they are. They're completely lost to our records. We keep people, by the way, on the rolls until they're 120 uh, to, to pad our statistics. But for all the reasons, uh, the church is no longer emphasizing growth. Growth has declined, and the church is in full free fall in Western Europe and in Japan and in, and in Canada and even in the United States. If it were not for the birth rate of active believing Mormons, which averages three children per family, which is larger than the average in the United States, If it weren't for the birth rate of active believing Mormons in the United States, the church in the United States would be in decline, right? And even so, predictions are within 20 years, uh, Mormonism within the United States will actually level off and start to be in decline um, as well. Now, that's not just Mormonism. If any of you have studied the Pew Foundation's Rise of the Nuns, you'll see that religion across the board in in Western Europe and in developed countries is on decline. And in fact, the fast, the largest and the fastest growing religious group is who? Those who no longer affiliate with any religious tradition, right? That's the largest and the fastest growing religious group. So uh, all religions are taking it in the shorts, uh, not just Mormonism. Um, And the church is starting to hide and hide its uh, contraction by uh, merging wards, by canceling wards, by, by canceling stakes, by canceling missions, by merging stakes and missions. And, uh, and you're seeing it, the, the, the most important number to track is number of members per unit or ward or branch or number of members per stake. And what you'll see that number is gonna grow and grow and grow and grow. And soon you're gonna have thousands and thousands and thousands of members per stake because these people that are on our rolls are not active. And and that's the way that you get to the real uh, activity rates in the church. Um, Some of you didn't like that I mentioned BYU football. It's not a big deal. I still like to cheer for the Cougars, but um, I think that you could argue that BYU football success could be a little litmus test or an indicator of the overall church health. And you, you would see. They should go independent. <laughs> you would see that in the 80s, the church, the church was at its zenith, and BYU football was at its zenith. And right now, BYU football is, is, is the worst that it's ever been. And ironically, University of Utah just won the Pac-12 South. Uh, unfortunately, they lost the, the Pac-12 championship. What's that? Don't say anymore. Okay. <laughs> But that's a huge accomplishment. That's over UCLA. That's over USC. That's over Arizona State. You know, University of Arizona. These are quality schools, right? Uh, and of course, uh, Utah State was nationally ranked. Uh, amazing football team. Weber State basketball just beat BYU, right? So anyway, that I think, I think a sagging athletics. And by the way, it isn't just football. It's basketball. It's it's women's cross country. When my wife Margie ran cross country for BYU, they were ranked fifth in the country. Uh, not not that highly ranked anymore. I I do think it it could be argued that that's a symptom of overall church health. Some of you could could disagree with me. Volleyball still thrives. Volleyball still thrives. Men men or women? Did you play volleyball for BYU? Okay. My sister coached. Oh, she did. <laughs> Uh, instead of celebrities either, uh, instead of Mormon celebrities just being faithful or going away quietly, what we're seeing for the first time in Mormon history is when Mormon celebrities 
disaffect from the church, they're willing to be open and public about it. You will remember Tyler Glenn, right? And his very public disaffection from the Mormon church, which led to his album called Excommunication, which led to several music videos that were very, very critical of the church, including him spitting on the face of the prophet, stripping down to his temple garments. Um, uh, none of which he's been excommunicated for, by the way. <laughs> which is very telling about the consistency and the integrity of the excommunication process, right? That, that, that it is clearly a, a PR and a marketing move or, or a move of convenience, but not one of integrity and consistency. Dan Reynolds, when he loses his faith in Mormonism, creates an HBO documentary that ends up winning awards or at least accolades at Sundance and is now showed on, on HBO, right? And in Mindy Gledhill and Julie de Azevedo, instead of writing EFY songs, are now coming on Mormon Stories podcast and talking about their faith challenges and their faith crisis. Mindy Gledhill is set to release an album fully dedicated to her loss of Mormon faith called Rabbit Hole. Check it out. Uh, um, do you like that title? Yeah. Support Mindy Gledhill and her amazing work. Um, celebrities, Mormon celebrities, are increasingly being willing to talk openly about their disaffections. Um, and that's something that's changed, and it's something that's going to continue. And they're not the last Mormon celebrities to fall, uh, I will just tell you. Um, temples are still dotting the globe. But we know why, right? Because the church, number one, it becomes a phenomenal real estate investment for the church. Because if they can do engage in land speculation, where they know ahead of time where they're going to announce the temple, and they can themselves and or friends or family members of church leaders buy up all of the real estate around the, where, the area where the temple is going to be built, and then they can announce the location of the building of the temple, and then all the land values can go up, because they're also going to probably build high-rise commercial real estate in the vicinity of the temple, right? All of a sudden, everybody who purchases that property is going to have this huge financial windfall. And this happens. And, by the way, the church has successfully tied temple attendance or attendance of your own child's marriage or wedding to the payment of tithing. Temples become a very... Uh, um, useful and effective way to ensure that members pay money to the church. And so that's why you're, you're seeing wards and stakes collapsing, but temples being built at an increasing rate because it means more revenue for the church. Um, even at, and you saw this in the Going Clear documentary. Scientology is on decline in terms of membership, right? Its buildings are empty, but it's actually increasing in revenue. Because as L. Ron Hubbard once said, if you want to get rich, start a business. If you want to get really rich, start a church or religion. And, and the church, you know, was once a billion dollar entity. Now it's a hundreds of billions of dollar entity. And it's going to continue growing. And that's pretty stark to think about 60 years ago, the church was bankrupt. So it's gone from bankrupt to hundreds of billions of dollars in 60 years. They're doing something right. They have a lot of power. Still not convinced me. <laughs> <laughs> they have a lot of power. But their power in Washington appears to possibly be on decline. Uh, Mitt Romney didn't get elected as president. And uh, uh, one, one listener wrote in to, to say that, they're, that, that the U.S. Congress right now has the lowest Mormon representation in, in 30 years. And in Arizona, we even saw an ex-Mormon, atheist, bisexual woman get elected as a U.S. senator. Right? And don't forget, abroad, we see an ex-Mormon feminist uh, working mother become prime minister of the country of New Zealand. Right? Yeah. Um, so that's, that's interesting. That's kind of cool. BYU is becoming more uh, conservative, not necessarily in the internal thoughts and beliefs of its professors, because we all know that there are dozens and dozens and dozens of active BYU professors that no longer believe the church is true, but are simply remaining silent about their loss of faith because they know that they lose their salary or their job or their pension or their livelihood by being open. But BYU has become a less 
diverse uh, intellectually and culturally uh, environment than it was when I went there. Um, women can now pray in Sacramini, hallelujah. Um, and they can pray in general conference, which is really nice. Some bold and courageous intrepid women actually wear pants to church, uh, although few still dare to, uh, to be so bold. Uh, birth control is now no longer an issue, really, unless you have some really extreme and weird bishop or stake president. And working outside the home is no longer denounced is it for women. And in fact, it's encouraged because number one, to live in Utah, both parents kind of have to now work outside the home to be able to financially survive here. But maybe the church got smart and realized that it actually means more revenue if both members of the home actually work outside the home. <laughs> women are now more visible in general conference. Um, women are now allowed to serve missions at a younger age. Instead of 21, it's 19. And women um, are, are encouraged to serve missions now because of sagging missionary rates and because of the fact that the church was losing its, its late teens and early young adults at, at massive rates, something like 80% of church teenagers and young adults were leaving the church. Uh, the church lowers the missionary age and basically saying, we don't even want you going to college before your mission because we're losing too many people just to college. So we're gonna get you on those missions immediately as our last best hope of keeping our young people from disaffecting from the church. And even at that rate, Greg Prince has said that 50% of returned missionaries, something like 50% of returned missionaries have left the church within five years after returning home from their missions um, by today's statistics. So that's kind of crazy. Um, there's now more pervasive female missionary leadership within missions. The church is, to its credit, uh, actually, it was forced, but the church has become significantly more open and transparent about its history. It's sponsored and bankrolled along with the help of Larry H. Miller, the Joseph Smith Papers Project. It, um, it, it publicized very openly and stridently uh, Rough Stone Rolling um, at Deseret Book. It finally was forced to release the gospel topic essays, probably more for legal reasons than for any other reason, so they could protect themselves against claims of fraud by deceiving and withholding information from its members. And that's why they released the information on the internet, but did what? Yes. Made it super hard to find and didn't tell everybody, right? Because they wanted it to be there, but they didn't want anyone to actually read it. And so still to this day, social science research shows that most bishops don't even know those essays existed and have not read those gospel topics essays. Um, but at least the church gets credit for being more transparent. It's updating its CES curriculum and its Sunday school curriculum. Now, some will say that it's done that um, to inoculate uh, its members. And you can even argue that it's true that the youth that are coming, that they sort of, they sort of given up on the people in their 30s and 40s and 50s. You guys, the church has kind of given up on. But the church's bet is if we mention peep stones when they're 14 or 15, if we mention polygamy and Joseph Smith when they're 14 or 15, we mention the book of Abraham and Papyra when they're young and impressionable, then when they get hit with that later, they'll go, oh yeah, I learned about that when I was in seminary, that's no big deal. That's the bet that they're making. Um, and there is some evidence that that inoculation is working. Um, so we shouldn't think that that's a, a fool's errand. However, when I travel the globe, uh, I am told repeatedly that Rough Stone Rolling, the Gospel Topics essays, were absolutely the impetus to many, many, many Mormons losing their faith. So it's a, it's, it's at best, it's a mixed sort of uh, strategy that's having some success, but also some failures. The church has quasi apologized for Mountain Meadows Massacre, and it's even published a book about it. Uh, Farms is dead. The Maxwell Institute is no longer an apologetic organization. Um, and, and the church has moved from old style, you know, version one apologetics with ad hominem and pseudoscience to more what I call neo-apologetics, right? Which is Richard Bushman, Terrell and Fiona Givens, Patrick Mason. And these types of people are basically saying, forget about truth, focus on goodness, forget about science, let's focus on the humanities and warm feelings. No more ad hominem. We're going to be loving and pastoral to people who enter into a faith crisis. And we're going to tell you, 
Maybe it's not about the church being true, but maybe it's about the church being good. And maybe it's not about the Book of Mormon being historical. Maybe it's Joseph. Maybe the Book of Mormon isn't a translation. Maybe the Book of Mormon is a revelation, right? And maybe the Book of Abraham isn't a translation, but instead the papyrus inspired Joseph to channel from God the revelation that became the text of the Book of Abraham. And it's changing, it's sort of bait and switching, changing the narrative very slyly, um, uh, but also it's moving away from literalism. And that's something that is just uh, a fact. Um, credible Mormon historians are now starting to be celebrated and even vindicated, right? And now all of a sudden, Richard Bushman, who's the person he quotes most in Rough Stone Rolling? Fawn Brody. Brody is his most quoted source in Rough Stone Rolling, right? Um, people like, people like uh, Thomas Murphy are being invited to BYU to be a part of anthropology or archaeological sort of seminars. And people like Sandra Tanner and Michael Quinn and Grant Palmer um, and, and so many others, Paul, posthumously, uh, Fawn Brody and Juanita Brooks and Leonard Arrington and Eugene England and Lowell Benyon, they're all starting to be celebrated as pioneers and as, uh, and, as, and as prophets, seers and revelators, right? People who actually had courage and integrity and could see ahead and knew what was true um, and were sort of prophets in the wilderness, right? Another yes. Another that we've seen is Emma Smith. You think when we went to seminary, she was excoriated now she's being rehabilitated. <coughs> Absolutely. Emma's gone from being the scourge and embarrassment and, and an evil Satan following woman. Now the church is calling her an elect lady and movies. celebrating her. What's that? Movies this year. The, yeah, we're putting out Hollywood blockbuster movies where Emma is just this loving, courageous, faithful person. Brigham Young is turning in his grave uh, <laughs> at, at our celebration and embracing of Emma Smith. Um, excommunications for apostasy have increased, but one of the things I'm most proud of is that we're turning excommunications into acts of courage and acts of celebration. And many of you are turning out to support the excommunications of Kate Kelly, of me, of Rock Waterman, of Denver Snuffer, of Jeremy Runnels, of Sam Young, of Bill Reel, uh, Carson and Marisa Calderwood, Jake and Amy Maloof, uh, tons of people, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, it's becoming a badge of honor to be excommunicated from the Mormon church. And it's actually, for apostasy. And it's actually becoming cool. And these people are becoming sort of cult or folk heroes where they're being, they're being honored and respected for their willingness to speak out publicly. Um, and many of us, are, are showing them love and support, which they deserve, because it's still a barbaric and medieval and violent, socially and emotionally violent act to excommunicate people for telling the truth. And as Bill Real showed in his latest excommunication, which was recorded on this device that's right here in front of you, by the way. <laughs> What Bill Real is testifying is, is that his leaders admitted that there's not one inaccurate thing he ever said, there's not one false thing that he ever said, and that every accusation he made about Elder Holland lying was actually factual and true. And what he was excommunicated for was for telling the truth, not for telling any lie. Has he been no, right? formal yet? It's it, it has not been announced. Who knows? What's tomorrow? Yeah, he's going to announce it tomorrow. He's going to announce it tomorrow. Of course he's been excommunicated. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. I'm, I'm we'll see. This much hope. Okay, well, let, let's hope. <laughs> this much. Insta yes, Gina. Are we chartering a plane to New Zealand? Yeah, I would love to support Gina. I would love to support Gina. Oh. I've been waiting for the letter. Has she received her letter yet? Yeah, let's not forget the amazing Gina Colvin. Uh, yeah, New Zealand author, podcaster, Gina now is being excommunicated. Elder Holland, on the one hand, will meet publicly with the leader of the Anglican Church and say, we love you, we're brothers. And then when one of its members actually uh, communes with the Anglican Church, 
to sort of serve in that community, we're going to quietly excommunicate them, but then publicly state that we're friends of the Episcopal or the Anglican Church. It's kind of a really severe act of hypocrisy to do that. But much love to Gina. Let's show her our support as well. Um, instead of the church being able to intimidate and silence its critics and its questioners, and instead of the church being able to hide information from its members for 40 or 50 or 60 years, we now have Mormon podcasts that are very pervasive, that are being downloaded at the rate of hundreds of thousands of episodes per month. Mormon Stories podcast alone and the other affiliated podcasts of the Open Stories Foundation had 6.2 million downloads and views in 2017. Thanks to those who supported us, 6.2 million. That was a, like a 50% growth over 2016. So in spite of the excommunications, listenership to podcasts is increasing and we have more and more podcasts uh, that are out there. We have Mormon Think, this incredible volume of resources of information about the church. We have the CES letter. We have letter to my wife. We have, what else am I forgetting? Mormon Leaks. Mormon Leaks. LDS scripture. LDS scripture. <laughs> we have ex Mormon Reddit. For the first time, Mormons have available, ready, available, instant access to all the information they need to make an informed decision. Our goal is never to lead people out of the church. All we want to do is awaken people to the factual, historical, cultural, social reality of Mormonism. Let them know exactly what they're actually joining or uh, paying or supporting and let them make an informed decision as to whether or not they want to join or remain a member. That's our only goal. Yeah. And tens of thousands of people each year are awakening to the realities of Mormonism, claiming their lives back and deciding what they want to do with their time and their money and their reputation. Um, and that's, uh, that's a good thing. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, the Lamanite generation has been renamed to the living legends. We no longer know who the Lamanites are. We're no longer really calling Latin Americans or Pacific Islanders Lamanites. There are some exceptions, but generally we're just backing away from the use of that term. Uh, the Indian Placement Program has been canceled. All the programs Spencer W. Kimball champ championed have, have been canceled. Some might be sad about that. Others are saying, hooray for the lack of cultural appropriation and the cancellation of cultural genocide. Um, but as a church, we, we no longer know who the Lamanites are. The, the principal intended audience for the Book of Mormon now has disappeared, and we actually have no idea who we're supposed to be sharing the Book of Mormon with as the primary audience. Uh, which is really ironic and interesting. Um, the, the Black Priesthood uh, ban, um, uh, of course we all know that that happened, it's been lifted, um, uh, but, but fortunately it's now been denounced as, as bad policy, and that's something the church was hesitant to do. We went from the 50s calling it doctrine, now to saying that the Black Priesthood ban, it was just a bad policy that never should have been implemented. Of course, throwing all those past prophets, seers, and revelators under the bus um, uh, and not never uh, acknowledging or apologizing that. Um, the Lamanite curse is no longer about uh, unworthiness and wickedness, right? It's about the, the, the light of Christ that's within them. And when we talk about their dark countenance, we're claiming that that, that curse is about their countenance, not about their skin color, right? <laughs> that's the way that the Book of Mormon is being reframed. Um, it's not about righteousness anymore and, and, and skin color. Interracial marriage. Uh, is now accepted. It's no longer openly condemned. The temple ceremony has been changed dramatically. No more weird naked touching, no more slitting throats and disemboweling yourself and scooping out your heart and these barbaric penalties for disclosing what goes on in the temple. No more five awkward five points of fellowship sort of stuff <laughs> between the veil. Now you just, uh, we've, we've erased all that from the temple ceremony. Um, and and I, pretty much everybody's happy about that. We've softened the, the sexist language and women now hearken to their husbands instead of, instead of obey. Same. Women, is that an improvement? Raise your hand if that's an improvement. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's okay. We've got some work, we've got some, uh, work to do. Uh, 
The temple ceremony, instead of being secret and sacred, is now shared publicly on YouTube for all the world to see. Garments are getting shorter, and we're seeing women along the Wasatch Front finding all sorts of creative ways to tuck their <laughs> garments under their miniskirts and, and their, their shorter sleeved outfits. Um, and the church is redesigning the garments to be more comfortable. They're actually taking away the stitchings of the, of the, the little marks, and instead they're making them uh, silk screen imprints on the back so you can't even tell that there are marks on the temple. They're actually trying to make them comfortable and humane for the first time. Um, for those of you still wearing garments, uh, bless you. <laughs> bless you. Uh, instead of the second anointing being this secret mystery, now we're having former high level church leaders talking openly and their wives talking openly about the second anointing for the first time. Um, which is very significant, I think. Um, instead of being viewed as this family-friendly church, uh, and the church still loves a certain type of family, and we're not going to ever question that, a traditional you know, uh, family the church is still very much in favor of. But the church, instead of being viewed as globally a lover of family, it's starting to be viewed as a bigoted organization towards non-traditional families. And that's something that's staining the reputation of the church, especially with millennials, and it's leading to significant disaffection. So we're losing on the family front um, more and more each day. Again, instead of billions, the church has hundreds of billions. Um, uh, uh, Mormon testimonies are starting to waver. There are tens of thousands of Mormons along the Wasatch Front and across the world who no longer believe the church is true, but who are not able to be open in public about it and who quietly attend sacrament meeting, take their callings and, and suffer in silence uh, as on, on the face active believing devout Mormons, but in reality in their, in their hearts uh, they no longer believe, they no longer believe the church's truth claims. They're having all sorts of behavior in private, um, you know, behind the scenes, sometimes with the knowledge of their spouse and family members, sometimes hidden from their spouse and loved ones. Either way, the, the, the average member commitment, faithful member commitment to the church, even amongst those who continue to attend the church, is weakening and waning uh, within the church. And I think that's just factually true. Um, uh, the church is oddly becoming stricter in its modesty standards. Now shoulders are pornographic. Now, you know, kids in the heated summer of summer camp have to wear jeans outside because they are not allowed to wear shorts outside anymore because somehow shorts are pornographic. That's kind of weird. Um, masturbation continues to be forbidden. Um, and sexual, is same, uh, sexual shame is at its apex within Mormonism, and ironically, Utah, by some accounts, leads the nation in pornograph pornography use. Um, so this epidemic of kids uh, being depressed and even suicidal over masturbation and sexual indiscretions is a, is a phenomenon completely restricted to Orthodox, Mormon, and, and Jewish and Catholic institutions. Other secular universities do not have counselors, counseling centers you know, filled with uh, suicidal masturbators. Uh, but, but we have that. We have that at BYU, and we have that at Utah State, and we have that at Weber State, and we have that at the, you know, to some degree at the University of Utah. Just not as much. Um, thankfully, the church is starting to change its practices of letting men be alone, thanks to the work of Sam Young and, uh, and Protect All Their Children. For the first time in history, the church is starting to take note that maybe it's inappropriate for a 50-year-old man to sit alone with a 12-year-old girl and ask her where she touches herself and how often. Or to ask a 16-year-old girl or boy, how far did you go? Did you orgasm? Did you enjoy it? Was it under the clothes? Was it out of the clothes, etc.? All of a sudden, the church is starting to realize that those practices uh, maybe aren't appropriate. Maybe aren't healthy. Maybe they open the church to lawsuits. And maybe they're incredibly damaging to the people that experience those things. Oral sex is no longer prohibited. 
Um, everyone knows about, you know, Blake, what's that? What's that? So that deserves more applause. You, I'm almost done. Knowledge about polygamy is pervasive now. Uh, and, and people are becoming familiar with the term polyandry. And, uh, you know, your polygamy podcast and Todd Compton's In Sacred Loneliness and, and Emma's, uh, Emma's book, uh, uh, Mormon Enigma, right? All these different books uh, and all the other resources, Mormon Stories Podcast and others, or Mormon Think and CES Letter, making everyone know about Joseph Smith's polygamy and the church is having to update its story and its narrative to uh, acknowledge that, that polygamy happened um, and to figure out some way to reconcile that. Um, oddly enough, uh, you know, the only people practicing polygamy are the remaining fundamentalists that exist and then people like Russell M. Nelson and Dallin H. Oaks. Um, they are still practicing polygamy. It's just celestial polygamy and not uh, earthly polygamy. But polygamy is still alive and well in Mormonism. Let's make no mistake about it. Um, of course, the church is, is now being willing for the first time to depict the Book of Mormon translation process in an accurate way, where you're starting to see church-sponsored you know, graphical illustrations of the Book of Mormon translation. And guess what elements are appearing that we've never seen before? A hat and a stone. And guess what's missing? The, the golden plates. <laughs> and all of a sudden the church is willing to portray for the first time more accurately. South Park led the way. <laughs> but eventually the church, uh, the church followed suit. Um, instead of Mormon, ex-Mormons and post-Mormons and daddy Mormons suffering alone, for the first time, um, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of Facebook groups and meetup groups and communities uh, and, and local groups to support ex-Mormons, post-Mormons, daddy Mormons, questioning Mormons. Uh, people who are struggling with Mormonism no longer have to be alone. And if you go to the website mormonspectrum.org slash map, you can find a global map of over a hundred face-to-face uh, personal communities like the Davis County Meetup Group, like Utah Valley Post Mormons, like WACA, Women's of a Certain Age. <laughs> all of these groups, uh, hundreds of groups all over the world, plus not to mention Mormon Stories Podcast Community, Thoughtful Transitions Facebook Community, the Thoughtful Faith Facebook Community. There are so many Facebook groups that are there to support you in your faith crisis or meetup groups, help you find friends, help you find mentors, help you find community to inspire you that you don't have to live uh, sinful, evil, dark, depressing, uh, drab, wretched lives if you leave the church. But in reality, you can actually improve your marriage, improve your parenting skills, improve your friendships, improve your relationships, and even improve your community relationships when you leave the church through the support of these communities and these resources. And all of a sudden people are a lot less petrified um, and willing to let go if there's something else better like the Davis County Meetup Group to hold on to when you let go of the church. With quitmormon.org, resignations are much easier and they're much more pervasive. I think there's at least 20 to 30,000 resignations each year. Um, that are happening, they're becoming more and more pervasive. Um, and being an ex-Mormon and a post-Mormon is becoming normalized. We're becoming more visible, we're more and more willing to speak out, to speak up, to come out. Um, and the stigma is being lifted. And what we're showing as post-Mormons and ex-Mormons is that we're not going away, we're not gonna live filthy, wretched, debaucherous lives. Okay, some of you are, <laughs> but for the most part, <laughs> But for the most part, what we are doing is we're showing increased health, increased happiness, increased intimacy, better relationships, more longevity, all of the, all positive things, uh, holding our heads high and standing firm and saying, I, I am no longer Mormon, but I'm healthy and I'm happy and I'm here to stay and I'm no longer ashamed. Deal with it, you know, <laughs> deal with it, everybody. Uh, we're here. So that's what's changed in the past 13 years. And I think everybody here is playing a part in making these changes come to pass. 
whether it's through your support of nonprofits, whether it's through your coming out publicly, private conversations, things you share on social media, you are all a small part or a large part or a medium part in helping to make these changes happen. Now, there are still uh, things that have not changed. Patriarchy still rules Mormonism. Obedience to authority is still the most sacred thing within Mormonism. Uh, Utah is still the multi-level marketing uh, uh, and fraud capital of the United States, right? The church still requires 10% of your income. Uh, masturbation and pornography are still shamed and forbidden. There's too much modesty shaming and, and sexual shaming. Men can still meet alone with women and children and youth behind closed doors, which needs to change. Um, and I don't think Sam Young and Protect LDS Children are going away anytime soon. Um, the church still has many policies and teachings that are racist and sexist and homophobic. Uh, the church still protects abusers uh, at the expense of victims and the abused. Uh, this church is still unwilling to apologize and they're on record as stating, we do not seek or give apologies. That needs to change. The church is still skeptical of science and factual history and scholarship. It's still encouraging people to uh, avoid anyone who leaves the church um, and to read any literature that would ever, or podcast that would ever cause you to doubt or question. By the way, that's the surest sign of a cult is any organization that will warn you to never talk to former members or to read literature that's against uh, the organization. That's the surest sign of a cult. So the church needs to stop doing that. It needs to stop labeling people who leave the church as anti-Mormons or any literature that questions or criticizes the church as anti-Mormon literature it needs to stop that. It needs to stop discouraging reading, learning, and thinking and talking about problems. It needs to stop excommunicating people who uh, question or challenge or speak the truth about the church. It needs to stop that. Um, and it needs to uh, uh, stop deceiving its members through works like the new book Saints. It's called Saints, right? <laughs> Or, or these neo-apologists that try and recontextualize church history in a faithful way by deceiving people, by omitting facts, and by spinning information in a way that's clearly deceptive. And the essays do that, and this new book, Saints, does that. It's a step, maybe it's a half step forward in terms of transparency. Yeah, maybe it's two steps forward in terms of transparency and honesty. But there's still too much deception going on. Unfortunately, there are a few things that have gotten worse. Believe it or not, um, depression and prescription drug use and abuse in Utah has skyrocketed, right? There's an epidemic of opiate abuse and, and death in Utah. Suicide rates of youth in Utah have skyrocketed, doubled or tripled in the past 10 years. Utah leads the nation in suicides of youth between the ages of 15 and 24. And um, inexplicably, the church comes out with this policy in November of 2015, basically claiming that marrying, legally marrying your loved one is a sin more grievous than murder, rape, or child abuse. Because guess what? Neither murder, nor rape, nor child abuse, nor embezzlement of funds, nor financial fraud, which ruins lives, none of those things mandatorily trigger a disciplinary council and excommunication. But inexplicably, the church passed a policy in November 2015 stating that the mere act of marrying the person that you love automatically requires excommunication from the Mormon church. When rape and, and physical abuse and murder do not. Completely inexplicable. And then it added insult to injury to say that the children of same-sex couples cannot get baptized or confirmed in the church or blessed. And they have to wait if they want to be members until they're 18 and only can they become a member of the church if they explicitly and publicly denounce the marriage of their parent. 
defying every Christian impulse or doctrine that any of us has ever been exposed to. It's completely mind-boggling. And then, of course, interestingly enough, five, ten years ago, there was this vibrant um, community of liberal and progressive Mormons. You would, you would find their writings on, on a blog called Times and Seasons. Most of you probably haven't ever heard of the blog Times and Seasons before. There's another one called By Common Consent that's still like limping. You know, it's on life support. But, but and, and there were these Mormon studies communities of all these leaders uh, in the Mormon community uh, who were these intellectual Mormon types that were clinging to faith and thought. And these people have disappeared. Where are the faithful Mormon intellectuals? Other than Terrell and Fiona Gibbons that are on the payroll of the church. They have, they have you know, financial contracts to write their books. Richard Bushman, these sort of, you know, uh, liberal Mormon celebrities that are paid money to fly around the world and give these secret firesides to bolster faith, right? Other than them and a couple others, Patrick Mason, Spencer Fluman, the, the faithful, intellectual Mormon studies community has disappeared. And I've gone to some of them and I've asked them, where are the faithful, liberal, progressive Mormon intellectuals? And they were all taken out by the November 2015 policy. Because that was just a bridge too far. And so the church is killing its own scholars and its own faithful, thoughtful um, members. Uh, so that's interesting. So I'll end by this. What gives me hope? So much gives me hope. That huge, massive laundry list that I just went through, that gives me hope. I used to think that the Mormon church was the same yesterday, today, and forever. That the church never changed. If we've seen anything, it's that the church changes massively, significantly, monstrously. The church changes, and the church is changing, and the list of negative changes is dwarfed by this massive list of what we would all consider to be positive changes. So uh, the church changes, it just doesn't change through the direction of God. It changes through the gift and the power and the authority of Google and social media <laughs> and podcasts and activists and you. We, it's grassroots revelation. We are the prophets, seers, and revelators in Mormonism. We are the leaders of the church. And we are dictating the changes of the church. The church is changing, and we are the ones changing the church. And many of you may be disinvested in the church changing. But guess what? There's still five or six million people that are living within this system. And I think we all care about them on some level. Many of them are your own brothers and sisters, parents, children, siblings, cousins, aunts, uncles, or community members. So many of you might do well to be invested in the church changing. And... 2018, above any year, should give you hope and encouragement that if anything is possible, it's that the church can make positive changes if people are willing to be courageous and speak up and uh, speak out and stand for something. If, if the past 10 years, 13 years have shown us anything, it's that positive change can be forced within the church through the internet, social media, and courageous activism. So that's very encouraging to me. What else is encouraging me? Broader social trends like the rise of the nuns. Uh, millennials don't care about Bruce R. McConkie and Mormon doctrine and peepstones and polyandry. They're just bored <laughs> with religion. It's irrelevant to them. It's just not relevant and it's bigoted and racist and sexist and homophobic. I am encouraged by the younger generations. I'm not one of those curmudgeonly old people who's like the, the youth of today. The, my, my daughters and son are more enlightened than I am now. And they're in their late teens and early 20s. They bitch slap me every day about <laughs> unenlightened things that I say, about racist and sexist and homophobic things that I say, right? They're woke. The younger generation is woke. And we should be excited about that. Uh, statistics encourage me. The fact that my podcast downloads are higher than ever in 2018. Yeah. And that's true with your polygamy. That's true with Bill Reel's Mormon Discussions. That's true with Pick Your Podcast. Uh, that's true with Jeremy Runnels and CES Letter. Um, the statistics show 
um, that uh, people are becoming more and more, they're becoming awakened, they're becoming enlightened all over the world. Um, Ex-Mormon Reddit now has over 100,000 members. And that growth is exponential, right? If you've seen those charts, it's exponential growth. Communities give me hope. Communities like this, communities like women's of a certain age, where over a thousand women all across the Wasatch Front and country and world are getting together to have book clubs and parties and, and discussion groups and, and Christmas parties and girls camp. girls camp, whatever it is that they're doing. Women of a certain age gives me, Waka gives me hope in humanity. And if you are not, if you are over 39 and you're not a member of Waka, you are crazy. So contact Kim Sandberg Turner today uh, and join Waka um, if you are a woman uh, over 39 and want and need support. There's even a 20s group. There's even a 20s group. There's a 30s group. There are groups for everyone. But it's not just Waka. There's the Utah Valley Post Mormon community. There's communities in Cache Valley. There's communities in Houston. All those groups in Mormon Spectrum. There are com vibrant, thriving communities all over the place. There's Salt Lake City Oasis. There's even a Davis County Oasis that's still uh, that's still uh, existing uh, and meeting. Still around. I was really happy to hear that. Um, uh, so many cool communities. There are communities that are secret that I don't even know about, that I probably don't want to know about. Um, or maybe I do want to know about them. But there are so many cool communities these days uh, to support post-Mormons, and that gives me hope. And the last thing that gives me hope is you. I have this amazing opportunity, this privilege, to travel around the world and talk to and meet ex-Mormons and post-Mormons. Uh, just last week, I got a group of 12 of them together, and we took a bus down to St. George to support Bill Real and his excommunication. One of the people in that van is actually here tonight. We karaoke it all the way down and back. <laughs> but these people don't just know how to party, right? post I, I a sign of a cult is any group that thinks their group is better than everybody else. So I never want to fall privy to the temptations of a cult. Having said that, <laughs> ex-Mormons and post-Mormons, in my experience, are some of the most strong, healthy, kind, compassionate, giving, fun, courageous, and truth-loving people that I've ever met in my life. So what gives me hope at the end of the day? It's you. And that's the end of my presentation.